Well, member for Elgin, Middlesex, Middlesex, London. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. And thank you to all of my colleagues for making me feel so welcome today. It, I'll get started when the member can. Thank you. Please, the Honourable Member. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And obviously, this is a very important debate that we're having today, as we can see the in the chamber debates taking place. It's truly an honour to stand here and talk about C-29, the act to establish a National Council for Reconciliation at third reading. And I'd really like to thank the committee who worked on this, who adopted many amendments to ensure that we do have a good piece of legislation, although we know we can still do more. In the preamble of this legislation, it's very clear the goals. And I just want to start off, for anyone watching today, what are the goals of this Reconciliation Council and why do we need to have it? And I quote from the preamble, the Government of Canada recognized the need for the establishment of an independent, non-political, permanent and Indigenous-led organization to monitor, evaluate, conduct research and report on the progress towards reconciliation, including in relation to the respect for and the protection and promotion of the rights of Indigenous peoples and all sectors of Canadian society and by all governments in Canada in order to address the truth and reconciliation of Canada's call to action number um, 51, 53. Mr. Speaker, like many parliamentarians, we are taking what is talking about truth and reconciliation and we are all working towards it. I can tell you that from going to the second annual Truth and Reconciliation Day um, just in Elgin Middlesex, London, Canadians, Indigenous community, Indigenous people, people are coming together because we recognize there must be work done and reconciliation is part of that. But one thing that I'd want to quote is my friend Chris Patrickwin. Chris is actually a member of the St. Thomas Chamber of Commerce, has a, a great business and does, a, and does tons of work. He is a leader in our community. But coming from the Oneida Nation, he said to me, Karen, there cannot be reconciliation unless we have clean water. And to me, that is very important. And the reason he says that is because in, from him, from the reserve of Oneida, just 20 kilometers to the west of the city of London, there has been a water boil advisory for over two years. This community is probably about 50 meters from a pipeline or from a water line. There's so many options. And I know that it takes all levels of government, indigenous people, indigenous communities, municipalities, provinces, and territories to work together. And that is why I am saying we must work together if we're actually looking for reconciliation. These solutions are when everybody is on side. Madam Speaker, when we look at this piece of uh, legislation, I recognize that there must be good governance and there must be accountability. There must be transparency, but most of all, there must be trust. This trust has been broken. This trust was never there, has not been broken. The trust was never there. And so it's important that we recognize that when government comes with their hands wide open, that we have to understand why there is pushback, that everybody needs to be part of that, and why this Reconciliation Council is very important. If the government's truly committed to implementing the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, we need to ensure that Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities are at the table. Reconciliation is about collective efforts from all people, from all generations. And today, there was an amendment that was tabled during this three, third reading, removing the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, known as CAP. And this, their seat was removed from this, this board of directors as this amendment. I'm sorry to hear that I, I believe that we do have one of our other opposition parties who are, are now choosing to side with the government on this, but it concerns me because I'm looking at the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. And we're, when we're talking about inclusion, when we're talking about representation of different ideas, different ideas need to be at that table. And by removing this, for unknown reasons, I don't know why they would want to remove this, what it's doing is taking a voice away from that table. And this is a voice that represents thousands of Indigenous people living in urban and rural centres. So I would question the uh, official, or I would question the, the Liberal government and the NDP party why they are changing this, why they are going to accept this amendment today, and why we are taking CAP off the table. Our mandate is to pr improve the social economic conditions of our constituency constituents, and that is exactly what having CAP at this table would do. It is another organization. I can tell you that it's really interesting because um, I'm, I sit on the Status of Women Committee, and I'm bringing that work that I do to that committee here. 
because we are coming forward and we will be putting forward um, under missing and murdered Indigenous women, we have finished a report that we should be very, very proud of, where we are talking about the calls to justice 13.1 and 13.5 from the National Inquiry. We got this work done and I'm going to be very excited when we can actually table it, but it's when we bring different voices, different opinions together, where we can actually work together and be able to get a report done that is bringing forward very, very strong recommendations about the safety for women. And to me, that is why it is important that we have everybody at the table. We know in the Status of Women Committee, we have four different political parties that are there, and you must work together with poli different political parties if you're trying to move a, an amendment, an option, or a recommendation. But when the people aren't at the table, it makes it much easier if you don't want any chaos. And so I, I once again would question why this government is not only removing CAP, but not allowing um, groups such as the, uh, there's an organization, it's funny, every time I start my speech, I'll stop reading it, and then I'm thinking, oh, where am I? I'm probably on page six. But we're talking about the Indigenous Economic National Organization. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, you know me. We're talking about the Indigenous Economic National Organization. And when we're talking about reconciliation, we also need to talk about the economic reconciliation. If we're trying to create vibrant communities where there is safety, there are opportunities for Indigenous people, it also comes with economic engines. And that is why I think it's very, very important that we do have organizations that are representing different views at this table. And perhaps that would have been the Indigenous Economic National Organization, but unfortunately, we will never know. Karen Ristoll, she was actually at the committee, and I would like to quote from her what she stated, and I quote, adequate funding and support for education, child welfare programs, and health investments in as the core of how we're able to succeed to achieve what I've just referenced in terms of robust challenges and objectives for ourselves. And she also stated, end quote, economic reconciliation is the vehicle forward in terms of setting our people, our communities, back on path to prosperity not only our nation, but the country as a whole. It really does take stronger, or it really does need to have a stronger social fabric. Madam Speaker, I arrived here in 2015, and, and probably like every other member who arrived here, we received two books. It was the final version of the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation. These two books, yes, they're massive, but they have really good, insightful information in there. But I would like to question this government why it has taken seven years for us to finally start taking actions against some of these very simple things. This, to me, is a very simple process of what we can do. They started some processes back in 2018, 2019, but it's 2022, and we're finally about to appoint our first council. To me, that is a concern. I also look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was established in 2008, and for me, it's really important because I came here as a new parliamentarian with very little knowledge of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But standing, sitting here in Parliament and listening to other parliamentarians, listening to people with lived experience, listening to my colleagues who have represented Northern and Indigenous communities, we need to be working on this. If we are looking for a journey of truth and healing, we need to create these relationships on a basis of inclusion, understanding, and respect. I would like to quote also from the final report. Because as a parent, I think this is something that really knocks me off my, just knocks me off my feet. As any parent would recognize, it would be so hard. But this is the quote from the very first page of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It can start with a knock on the door one morning. It is the local Indian agent or the parish priest or perhaps a mounted police officer. The bus for res uh, and the bus for residential schools leaves that morning. It is the day that the parents have longed, dreaded, and the children have been, awarded, uh, 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 been warned advanced in the mornings about this shock. The officials arrive, and the children must go. Madam Speaker, this is the truth, and we have to recognize this truth, the truth of Indigenous people who have gone through this for many, many decades. <coughs> let's move together, let's work together, and let's ensure that if we're going to have a council, that it is appropriately appointed, not by the Prime Minister, not by the Minister, but properly appointed by organizations that are going to be working together. There needs to be proper oversight, but if we're putting in an appointed council that is going to be representing the, the wants and needs of the Prime Minister and the Minister, that is not appropriate. 
we need to make sure that all are at the table and that it is an inclusionary because the path to journey is the truth. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker.